A very good evening to one and all. I'm Jonathan from the National Heart Center Singapore. And today it gives me a great pleasure to introduce one of the newest initiatives brought to you by the APSC uh, Emerging Leaders Group, Teaching Moments in Heart Failure webinar series. The first of this webinar series, uh, the title is Approach and Management of Acute Heart Failure. This uh, session is endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, accredited by EBAC, and as uh, we would like to kindly uh, thank uh, AstraZeneca and Boringer Ingelheim for giving us an educational grant to support this uh, initiative. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our APSE Young community. We are a group of uh, like-minded, passionate individuals uh, who have uh, kind of banded together across the region, launched several initiatives. Um, more details can actually be found on the APSE main webpage. If you look uh, where the red arrow is, you know we have a link to our Young Community webpage and uh, below some of the initiatives that uh, we have launched. In particular for today, this um, session is brought to you by the Heart Failure Young Community. So this teaching moment uh, in Heart Failure series is organized by the Heart Failure Young Community. The leads uh, we have with us today are Julian, uh, Vibiona, as well as Gary. They have kindly put together this um, webinar session. This is going to be a quarterly webinar series, so once in three months. It will cover pertinent topics in heart failure, including acute heart failure, FPAF, HFREF, cardiogenic shock, so on and so forth. For today's session, uh, this is a brief outline. We will have a keynote lecture on the management and diagnosis of acute heart failure, titled If You Can't Find a Solution. There will be two interesting cases that we hope will encompass uh, and highlight some of the learning points in the lecture. And there will be an interactive discussion and question and answer after each segment. Today, my co-chair is uh, Professor Jack Tan, who is the immediate past president of the APSC. And uh, we have a good uh, lineup of speakers. Julian from Singapore, Gary from uh, Australia, and Bibiona from Indonesia. As I mentioned previously, all three of them are the co-leads of the APSC Heart Failure Young Community. We have an esteemed panel of panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Lin Weitin from Singapore. Dr. Evangelista K from the Philippines, and Professor John Atherton from Australia. Just a quick housekeeping slide. Uh, the contents of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC, and this webinar will be live streamed on the APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. You can kind of uh, go back there to refer to it, you know, uh, if you want to rewatch the session. CME points will be submitted uh, for those who are connected throughout the whole duration. And very importantly, if you have any questions and answers, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and post your questions there. And we'll try to answer them during the discussion segment of the session. So without further ado, let's get started. I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Clinical Assistant Professor Julian Lowe from uh, National Heart Center Singapore. He's the director of the coronary care unit. And currently uh, he's um, based actually in Petworth Hospital uh, in Cambridge uh, doing his advanced um, heart failure fellowship. So Julian, please. Ah, thanks very much, John. Sorry, can I just try to share the screen if that's okay? Can you guys see my slides? Yeah, you can see okay, it. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, and I just think one, one last thing, uh, if, if it's okay. I'm sorry, I think we the, the schedule said it would be an hour, but I think we might need about one hour, 15 minutes to cover all the content, uh, but we'll see how we go. So uh, good. Morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the session. I hope to, through the next 20 minutes, kind of take us through acute heart failure, uh, introduce the scope of the problem and talk about why it's such a pertinent um, issue today. Uh, I hope to provide a quick update on the guidelines and take us through some of the new papers that I think you might find interesting with regards to acute heart failure. And with regards to the title of the talk, I think if you can't, if you can't really solve the problem, you might have to think of redefining the question or redefining the population that you are managing. And then we'll take a look at any take home messages. So the ESC guidelines remind us that heart failure is a leading cause of hospitalization in adults over 65 of years, 65 years of age, and is associated with high mortality and rehospitalization rates. Mm -hmm. We know that the clinical cause of heart failure is interspersed with acute life-threatening deteriorations. And until recently, we used to think of these deteriorations as something that was just par for the course, part of the life cycle of heart failure. But we now know that any hospitalization for heart failure portends worse prognosis, takes you down a much steeper trajectory that is associated with worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. 
We saw in the previous slide that the inpatient mortality for hospitalization for heart failure was 4 to 10%. The one year mortality is estimated at about 25 to 30%. And at the bottom left, we see that the mortality is highest at the one month period after discharge. At the bottom right, we see that each hospitalization for heart failure reduces your median survival time, so much so that after three hospitalization, your median survival is estimated at about one year. Well, if that is true for hospitalized heart failure patients, then what about patients who have worsening heart failure but are not hospitalized? By extension, this group should have a poor prognosis as well. And the top left uh, graph is really to remind us that it's not a dichotomy of inpatients who are at higher risk and outpatients who are at low risk. There is a spectrum of patients with advanced heart failures in the outpatient population as well. And looking through randomized data on the top right, we can see that patients with worsening heart failure have outcomes that are not quite the same, but, but definitely comparable to patients who are hospitalized with heart failure. And not just in randomized data, but at the bottom you see in large in the Danish registry studies, we see that patients who have diuretic intensification certainly have worse prognosis uh, in terms of mortality, and those who have both hospitalization for heart failure and diuretic intensification have, have, have the worst prognosis of the three groups. So coming back to this, we go back to the definition of what acute heart failure is, and we try to define the scope of the problem. And you can see that from 2005 to 2016, the heart failure guidelines was quite harmonized, and they said the same things. These were a group of patients who developed life-threatening conditions. It was a very rapid onset, number one, and they required to be admitted for heart failure, number two. The ESC 2021 Guideline Writing Committee informed us that they thought very hard about these definitions and chose to redefine the problem slightly. So first, the change in the definition was that it did not need to just be rapid, but it could be rapid or gradual. And we will see the reasons why in the next two or three slides. The second, reason, the second change is that it was the event was severe enough to require the patient to seek urgent medical attention. And it did not just need a hospital admission, but as long as they sought urgent medical attention, be it an ED visit, that counted as well. The last thing to see on the slide is just terminology and definitions. Acute heart failure refers to the index de novo presentation. Acute decompensated heart failure is a decompensation of the chronic heart failure patient, and that is, forms the majority or the bulk of the presentations. This is the Stevenson classification of heart failure, which has informed our practice for the management of acute heart failure for many, many years. It's very long standing. And it reminds us to think of heart failure as both a congestive backward failure, as well as a hypoperfused forward failure. And where dry and warm on the top left is where we want most of our patients to be. The majority of patients, 66% of them come warm and wet, meaning it's a predominantly congested patient. A very small proportion of patients will come in dry and cold, meaning they are hypoperfused with a forward failure, and you assess that by patients with a very low um, pulse pressure index and who have who are, who are clinically cold and have all the signs of organ hypoperfusion, like um, confusion, decreased urine output, and things like that. The patients with the worst outcomes are those who are wet and cold. And so the treatment is tailored from that perspective to diuretics for congestion and inotropes for patients who are. Um, hypoperfused. So in the ESC 2021 guidelines, we return back to the phenotypes of heart failure. Now, the original guidelines in 2005 and 2008 classified acute heart failure into phenotypes. This disappeared in the next two guidelines in 2012 and 2016. So some of us were a bit surprised to see the phenotypes come back, but they mainly grouped them into four groups now. And of course, this is really to sort of guide research and to kind of guide to classify this um, this basket of patients uh, rather than lumping them together as one group of acute heart failure. So what is the difference between acute decompensated heart failure and acute pulmonary edema? The phenotype is slightly different, uh, we, are, we are told, insofar as patients with acute decompensated heart failure come in due to excess fluid overload. So these are patients who have excess fluid in the system. This takes place gradually over days and these patients need to, and so from that perspective, this is why they said gradual onset. This is in distinction to acute pulmonary edema, where it comes much quicker, like a flash acute pulmonary edema. And this occurs not because of excess fluid in the system, but due to a fluid redistribution problem. And these patients tend to be hypertensive. 
um, tend to be hypertensive. The guideline committee did also say that these phenotypes can overlap sometimes. Third, you have isolate, isolated RV failure. RV failure, of course, is a talk in itself, and RV failure is not a disease by itself. Of course, there are many different types. You have patients with pulmonary hypertension with congenital heart disease, and in advanced heart failure with mechanical support of transplant, RV is something we look at very closely as well. And all these groups of patients are all slightly different with different considerations. And finally, you have cardiogenic shock. And cardiogenic shock, I guess, is a topic in itself. Cardiogenic shock is something that we have been that hopefully we have now harmonized the definition of with the SCI classification that is based on the Intermax uh, classification. And we'll discuss that uh, as a separate topic. So this is to go back to the difference between acute decompensated heart failure versus acute pulmonary edema. And this is a paper by Dr. Fallick in 2011. And we see that any sympathetic activation can really lead to circulatory congestion by two mechanisms. One is by what we traditionally think of is through sodium and water retention with fluid accumulation that's slow and takes place over days, and that's acute decompensated heart failure. But there can be also mobilization of the venous reservoir due to decreased capacitance and, and essentially tapping into that unstressed volume from the splanchnic system leads to very fast increases in effective circulatory volume, and that occurs much more rapidly. So this is a distinction between those two groups. I'm not going to go through this slide in any great detail, except to tell you that um, guidance is provided depending on what phenotype the patient presents as. But the broad principles of management for all four patients that, for all four groups of patients that falls back to the Stevenson classification really is, number one, for acute heart failure, you secure the airway. Supplemental oxygen, if they're hypoxic, is class 1C. Non-invasive ventilation is class 2A. And intubation is class 1C uh, in terms of Airway, uh, securing the airway. The second focus then is to diurese out the excess volume. We use loop diuretics, class 1C. Sequential blockade is recommended in the guidelines, but acetazolamide is quickly coming up as an adjunct that can that should be considered um, early. UF has fallen out of favor after the caress H of Schrall suggested harm. We optimize heart function with inotropes and vasodilators, but lessons from clinical trials from 2002 to now tell us that perhaps this is not as useful as we think it should be. And the fourth step we do then is to treat the precipitant of the acute heart failure. So coming to diuretics, and I might take some time on this slide if that's okay. We use Lasix or, or as a loop diuretic most frequently to treat um, any decompensatory episode. And the, guide, and the evidence for this is actually really quite poor. So the first thing to say when we use loop diuretics is we try not to give too high doses early. The reason for that is because we don't want to cause harm. We don't want excessive uh, loop diuretic use. It's associated with, with electrolyte problems. It's associated with activation of the renin angiotensin system. So the recommendation is to use the oral dose converted to IV or to double the oral dose and convert to IV. But this guideline committee now recommends that you monitor it a lot more strictly. And so after two hours after you give the IV diuretic, you need to monitor the urinate spot sodium, make sure it's above 50 to 70, and measure the urine output at six hours to make sure it's more than 100 to 150 mils per hour. And the reason for this is informed by the dose trial. The dose trial, when it came up, was the largest clinical trial looking at diuretic therapy in acute heart failure, which was quite embarrassing because there were only about 300 patients uh, in that trial. So that is the that really shows us how little evidence we have in this field. And what was very striking about the dose trial really was that at 72 hours after initiation, 80% of the patients, and remember these are high dose loop diuretics, 80% were still congested at 72 hours. And as a group, the outcomes were really poor. At two months or 60 days after discharge, 50% of these patients were either dead or they were re-hospitalized re for heart failure. So that was the extent of our of our data for, for diuretics. So what the guideline committee here is saying is that they would recommend that the response to the diuretic be gauged. Um, and if let's say there's a suboptimal response, we recommend that the diuretic dose is then double, or you consider sequential blockade with the thiazide-like diuretic. So that was in 2021 when the guidelines came out. Well, in ESC 2022, the ADVO trial was published, and this was quite this was quite a big trial for us in the heart failure community. And this was a very old drug, uh, acetazolamide. And the ADVO trial is now the largest clinical trial in diuretic therapy. It recruited about 500 patients. And what it showed in this trial was three days of IV acetazolamide at 500 milligrams as an adjunct to IV diuretics, uh, double the dose of the oral diuretics 
versus the double the dose of IV diuretics plus placebo. And they looked at the clinical congestion score. Their group, their population was patients with acute decompensated failure who were clinically congested, and this was confirmed with imaging, with a high anti-pro BNP and were on a baseline Lasix dose of at least 40 milligrams or equivalent. And what they did was the exclusion criteria, I think, were patients who were large, the major exclusion criteria were patients who were on SGLT2 inhibitors, who were on acetazolamide, those with systolic blood pressures of less than 90, and those who um, had an EGFR of less than 20. And what they shown was that what they showed was that there was a 50% improvement in decongestion uh, with the patients hitting a decongestion score of less than one. And the number needed to treat was about eight at 72 hours. A number needed to treat by discharge was six. So it was a very, it was a very significant, the positive clinical trial. Uh, and we can discuss the use between metolazone, which is uh, for sequential blockade, or the use of a carbonic andri uh, CAI, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which is acetazolamide, later in the discussion. And I, I'd be well, I'd, I'd really like to hear everyone's thoughts about this. But this was quite a big trial for us uh, when it came out, and it has certainly uh, changed practice. In terms of hemodynamic optimization into for inotropes and vasodilators, the recommendations have been downgraded for the ESC 2021 guidelines and the ACC 2022 guidelines to class 2B for all vasodilators. And for inotropic agents, it's class 2B as well. And the reason for this is on the back of a large number of negative vasodilator trials from 2002 uh, till now. And what we see repeatedly in all these trials is that the hemodynamic improvements uh, the reduction in wedge pressure, the improvement in the cardiac index for phase 2b trials do not necessarily translate to heart clinical outcomes in phase 3 trials. So this is something that, um, that confuses us a lot. It's something that a lot of thought has gone into, and it's something that's very frustrating, but I think, um, I think the, the, the data has been quite consistent. And unless there's a breakthrough in this, uh, vasodilators are now de-emphasized. The final point we talked about was reversible causes. So um, as Dr. Butler reminds us, we think of acute heart failure as a fever. You need to identify the precipitating cause. These are common causes of, of uh, decompensation that need to be assessed for and thought of when a patient comes in with a decompensatory episode. So shifting gears a bit and um, considering everything that we've talked about has really been a failure of therapy on our part in terms of loop diuretics or failure to prove benefit in terms of vasodilators, how do we go on to manage the problem? Well, I think a lot of us have now changed our approach to us to when a patient is admitted for an acute decompensatory episode to think of it as a chance for early initiation of guideline-directed medical therapy. We know that hospitalization for heart failure is a key opportunity to optimize GDMT. The patients are more likely to be treated, they're more likely to tolerate it, more likely to adhere and more likely to persist on the medication, and therefore are more likely to feel better, reduce hospitalization for heart failure, and have less mortality. But while this is a class one recommendation, the level of evidence is C. And we see this in our old clinical trials from from the foundational therapies, where in ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and beta blockers, there's really no randomized controlled trial data regarding in-hospital initiation of, of these drugs. And for MRAs, there's very limited randomized controlled trial data. However, if we look at these trials, there seems to be a benefit in starting the drug early from 14 to 28 days in terms of cl hard clinical outcomes, including a separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves. So the first trial to report in the space was really the Pioneer Heart Failure Trial. And the Pioneer HF trial looked at patients with HEF-REF with acute heart failure after hemodynamic stabilization. The criteria was defined as at least six hours of systolic blood pressure above 100, no increase in IV diuretics, and no use of IV vasodilators, as well as no use of IV inotropes in the last 24 hours. So this is the definition of the stabilizing criteria. The primary outcome was a change in anti-pro BNP as a surrogate, uh, for improvement, and we saw that sacrificial valsartan uh, reduced the anti-pro BNP and was clinically safe. So the Pioneer HF started off the, this discussion by showing safety during inpatient initiation after stabilization with a good outcome in terms of anti-pro BNP reduction. The second trial was Solus WHF. This wasn't a trial that was specific for acute heart failure patients, but about 50% of them were initiated inpatient. Sotoglyphosin was compared to placebo and type 2 diabetes when patients were recently hospitalized for worsening heart failure. 
And uh, the primary endpoint is total number of CV deaths and hospitalizations or urgent visits for heart failure. And from this perspective, there was an improvement. But as we all know, Solus WHF was uh, terminated prematurely uh, due to loss of funding. Um, and so there may be some limitations to that. This brings us to the final study uh, that has been published to date, and that is the MPULSE trial. MPULSE trial looked at empaglifosin in patients who were stabilized after an episode of acute heart failure. The criteria was similar to Pioneer, and what they looked at was then a hierarchical uh, endpoint of um, time to death, frequency of heart failure events, time to heart failure events, and KCCQ symptom score. And what it showed from this outcome was a win, stratified win ratio of 1.36, meaning patients treated with empaglifosin were 36% more likely to experience a clinical benefit uh, compared to uh, placebo with empaglifosin. So as a quick summary of, of, of the trials we've just discussed, Pioneer was mainly in the HEFREF population uh, and showed um, for both diabetics and non-diabetics and showed inpatient initiation was safe. Soloist WHF included all heart failure patients who were diabetic, but 50% of them were initiated inpatient and the trial was prematurely terminated. Impulse was for both HEFPEF and HEFREF. For diabetics and non-diabetics, the trial was all initiated inpatient and had a heart clinical endpoint. Uh, the next trial that we're looking out with, um, with a lot of uh, anticipation then is the DICTATE AHF trial, which will report on the efficacy and safety of dipoglyphosin of in acute heart failure. And um, so that's the next trial we're looking out for. So I'm so the takeaways from the talk really is that number one, heart hospitalization for heart failure or worsening heart failure portends worse prognosis. And it should not just be viewed as part of the heart failure life cycle, but as an opportunity to intervene in a patient who is suddenly getting a much worse prognosis and a much worse outcome. From a guideline update perspective, the definition of acute heart failure has now been broadened. It doesn't just look for acute deteriorations, but gradual onset is acceptable as well. It doesn't just include hospitalized patients, it also includes patients who need to seek urgent medical attention. Uh, we have returned to the phenotypes of, of um, acute heart failure, and I think that is really to guide our research and to guide our understanding of the different phenotypes. The, um, uh, the guideline committee hoped to emphasize that congestion predominates in heart failure, be it HEFREF or HEFPEF. Congestion is the major issue, and assessment of diuretic effect is very important. As we discussed, uh, you need to assess urine spot sodium and urine output and add adjuncts as necessary. Vasodilators are de-emphasized on the background of multiple negative clinical trials. The broad principles of acute heart failure remain the same as they always have been. Class one recommendations are with regard to, air, to securing the airway. Decongestion is important. Loop diuretics are recommended as first line, but acetazolamide should be, can be considered as an adjunct upfront. Um, as someone who works in uh, acute heart failure setting with advanced heart failure patients, uh, I would implore you not to forget to assess for hypoperfusion because that's important as well. And uh, lastly, identify treatable precipitants uh, and the new monitor there is CHAMPIT. The final point I was hoping to get across um, for, uh, for discussion is that early initiation of foundational guideline-directed medical therapy alters heart failure disease progression, reducing mortality and hospitalization for heart failure, ANI has shown to be safe and reduces anti-proBNP. Ampaglifosin is safe and reduces and demonstrates short-term clinical benefits. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Julian. Okay, could we end, uh, stop the sharing of the screen? Maybe go to, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Julian. It was a great talk. I think you covered um, a lot of aspects of uh, the management of uh, acute heart failure. And um, maybe I'll just open up to the uh, panel. Anyone has any comments or any questions? Uh? Hi, Dr. Yeah. Julian. Thanks for your discussion. Yeah. So you mentioned about worsening and acute heart failure, right? So now with the advent of like very sequat medications for worsening heart, heart failure, so how do you think we can help the clinicians or your cardiologist on differentiating if this is already a path of worsening heart failure or this is just one event of acute heart failure. Sorry, so your question was what, uh, what yeah. is the difference between? Yeah, the worsening heart failure so and versus the acute heart failure. So because of the advent of like very sigwa, the medication is being given for like the recommendation is it is for people with um, 
worsening heart failure. So there are questions if how can we categorize if the patient is already in the stage of worsening versus a stage of just an acute decompensation? Uh, I see. Sorry. So um, yeah. So that's that's a that's a that's an interesting question. I'm not really sure that there is a very clearly defined difference. And of course, it's not a dichotomy, it's a spectrum. Um, I think part of what I was trying to say earlier is that the decision to admit is partly a medical construct insofar as if they are sick enough, they need to be admitted. But part of it may be a logistical construct as well, insofar as if your hospital is beds are very full and you've got an early outpatient follow-up uh, readily available, you might choose to, to go down that route. Uh, I don't really think of them as separate issues. I think uh, Verisigot is a is a good drug. I think it can be it can be considered in in in, in either setting, and um, I don't we don't have a lot of experience with Verisigot. We something that is that we are still uh, we have started to use over the last two years, I'd say, but I don't have a large volume of patients on Verisigot uh, personally, uh, for for various different reasons. But um, I don't think from a from a literature perspective there should be a difference i think they i think it can be used in both groups that's an interesting yeah. concept and maybe I, I would like to open that uh, question also to our uh, professor atherton you know is there any difference between someone who's um, gradually decompensating versus a kind of like an acute uh, episode and, and how do you tease uh, tease them apart yeah well i mean i think it, the, the, the worst thing heart failure term is um, includes someone who's been hospitalised with acute heart failure, and we think of it as an outcome, but also, as you correctly point out, it's being used now as a treatment selection, for example, for viraciguate. And, uh, and so if a patient's admitted to hospital, they would tick that box as saying they've had worsening heart failure. Um, although while they're in hospital, we call them acute heart failure, and I agree with what Julian's saying, is they're really all the same thing. That's just a matter of, it, it, it is a medical construct of whether we decide to admit. And, uh, and uh, but you know, if they've turned up to the emergency department and sent home, well, that's worsening heart failure. If they're in hospital in the home or early discharge to a rapid access clinic, we can still call that worsening heart failure. And some might say that diuretic intensification is also worsening heart failure. So I think worsening heart failure does capture a broad group. And that group does include people who are gradually worsening as well as someone who's acutely decompensated. It's just that when they're acutely decompensated, I guess we apply a, a different strategy to try and st stabilise them, for want of a better term, to then be able to apply our chronic therapies where all the evidence is. Because as Julian's nicely pointed out, you know, whether we're talking about diuretics and Advil is probably the most positive study we have, looking at a congestion endpoint and uh, rather than you know, a, a hard clinical outcome, of course, uh, and the same with phasoactive therapies have been a bit disappointing. It's really about stabilising the patient so we can start those longer-term therapies. So I think they're all part of the same, so I agree with what Julian said. Maybe we will take a question uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a question from um, someone who's asking, what's the role of tovaptan in uh, acute decompensated heart failure? Maybe I could uh, direct that question uh, to Wei Xin. Yeah, hi. So thanks for the question. So I'm not sure how available Tovaktan is in the region, but I think our colleagues from East Asia, Japan, Korea, they have lots of experience using Tovaktan. And we do model our Tovaktan usage in Singapore based on Japanese uh, guidelines. So Tovaktan on its own, it um, sounds like a great uh, drug because it works away from the uh, renal uh, tubules. It actually works on the collecting ducts of the, the, the kidneys. And it uh, is an anti anti diuretic hormone. So, in theory, it works really well. The kind of evidence that we have for Tovaptan use, they are on soft endpoints on decongestion. We do not have much uh, high rehospitalization or mortality endpoints. Clinically, Tovaptan is useful for patients who have severe volume overload and we find that in our clinical practice the more hyponatremic that they are the better response they have with tovaptan so it can be used as an adjunct the evidence is not very strong definitely we do not have large uh, uh, clinical trials to support its use the numbers included in the tovaptan trials were smaller than in Advil, so it is a possible adjunct, especially in patients with hyponatremia. That's how we use it. Thanks, Wei Ting. That's a, a great summary on uh, the use of uh, Tovaptan.
maybe we take another question uh, from the uh, audience uh, from Ini. Uh, she mentioned, uh, I would like to ask about the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in the acute heart failure setting, especially in STEMI, and if there's any recommendation. And part two is, how would you sequentially start you know, the four big groups of uh, heart failure medicines in the acute heart failure setting? Maybe I'll direct that question first to um, Professor Atherton. Yeah, well, I think for STEMI, enroll them in a clinical trial. And we'll hopefully get that answer. So at the moment, no. Um, of course, if once they meet the, the current indications, which is based more on ambulatory patients um, with heart failure and either reduced, mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction, that's fine. But in the acute setting, you treat the acute heart failure with a STEMI and, uh, and of course, that's something which we, you know, is, is being tested in a clinical trial for that specific indication. About the Fantastic Four, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Julian summarised it nicely by saying most of the studies have all been in ambulatory heart failure, but he mentioned some of the evidence there for Arnie's and SGLT2 inhibitors. And in fact, if you go back to the ambulatory heart failure evidence, you've got consensus with enalapril, you've got Copernicus with Carvedilol, You've got Ephesus, which was a post-MI, admittedly, um, study with a plerinone. These are patients who are pretty sick or, you know, based on your medical construct, they could have even been admitted to hospital with heart failure. So I'd say that most of our evidence in the ambulatory setting, it's reasonable to apply to the acute care setting once the patient's been hemodynamically stabilised. So that's certainly my approach. And the strong HF study, um, of course, and I don't know if that's going to come up later in discussion, was a, a beautiful example of why, how we want to be applying the fantastic. In that time, it was a fantastic three, but now it's a fantastic four in that acute care study once the patient's been stabilised and then transitioning them to the community. Maybe no. just to add on a uh, just to add on the point about using SGLT two inhibitors in the acute MI setting. In the early days of empagliflozin, I've been telling everyone I've been um, personally responsible for causing a few DKAs because of early use of um, SGLT2 inhibitors following an acute MI episode. So it is not without this risk in using in a patient with a huge catecholamine surge after acute MI. When you have a huge catecholamine surge, there is a relative insulin resistance, and that can give patients problems if you start them on something like an SGLT2 inhibitor. So we do have um, some clinical trials running about using SGLT2 inhibitors soon after AMI, and that's the MPEG study, which is uh, currently enrolling or has finished enrollment, I'm not sure. So that study looks at empagliflozin following an acute MI episode. And the time that we start patients after the acute event um, is two weeks. So the earliest, earliest that we should be thinking of starting SGLT2 inhibitors for the treatment of diabetes or for treatment of heart failure after AMI, I would say at least two weeks. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's yes, an um, yeah. interesting concept. Uh, in vengeance, do you uh, have any comments? Or? Yeah, doctor. Okay. Yeah, so we mentioned about the four, four pillars of heart failure treatment. Now they're including the fifth pillar, which is cardiac rehabilitation. Aside from the medical management, we must be uh, very aware that before we discharge these patients who had an episode of acute heart failure, we must refer them to cardiac rehab just to give them, again, confidence on how to move around when they get, get home. Yeah, so I think, you know, the take-home points here, you know, that everybody is mentioning, you know, you treat the acute heart failure episode, which is really all about congestion. You get them to a safer spot and while they are inpatient, you know, you can, you know, start, you know, whichever combination of the um, four classes that uh, you feel more comfortable with. Maybe I just have a quick question. You know, we talked a little bit about um, the cold and wet patients. Uh, you know, this is a subset of patients that we are most afraid of and they do the worst. Uh, is there... A, does anyone want to share their experience about um, you know, what kind of inotropes or what kind of strategies um, are best suited to treat these patients? Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Julian first. Yeah, that, thanks, John. That, that's a tough question. Um, I think a lot of the mm -hmm. times, once you start going into the concept of cold, you're talking about hypoperfusion. And as much as we say, as much as we know that hemodynamic profiling doesn't always translate well to outcomes, I think it's what we do. So most of the times now with uh, anyone who's cold, we will float a swan. A uh, swan is recommended uh, in term once you are thinking that the patient is in shock. And while 
we know that they might not necessarily translate to good outcomes. I think that's what we target a lot of the time. From an inotrope perspective, uh, which is what we always go to, uh, we personally, we tend to use dobutamine. Uh, the evidence for that is not great. Uh, you can also consider using levosimendin if, let's say, there is issues with beta blocker toxicity. Uh, levosimendin is a much more potent vasodilator. Uh, it's an inodilator, and the vasodilatory effect is a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of caution uh, at, um, when you use that. Uh, and similarly with milrinone, if you're thinking more RV failure, that, that can help as well. Uh, but the quick answer to, to what you're saying is in the event of someone who is cold, we need to focus on inotropes. Um, the vasodilatory part, I think, is important as well. Uh, but um, the clinical trial data doesn't support that. From the decongestive perspective, as we mentioned, um, the inotropes can help you to achieve better decongestion if you're thinking that it's a delivery issue. And uh, as the guidelines mentioned, we should really focus on trying to decongest them as much as possible. And using loop diuretics alone usually leads to suboptimal outcome in the acute heart failure setting. Um, MCS, I guess, is your really the, the step that you're trying to avoid. But if you need mechanical um, devices to support the patient when they're hypoperfused, then needs must. That, that would be my general approach. Thanks. Thanks, Juliana. I think we went through quite a lot of key principles on the management uh, of a patient in acute heart failure. So this gives a good segue into um, seeing a case, you know, and how we apply some of these principles in a real-life patient. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Gary Gunn from Sydney, Australia. Is going to present uh, to us a case titled uh, Perseverance, Not Perspiration. And I'm really curious to hear what this case is about. Gary, please. Gary, you're muted. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. And the slides are going okay? Yep, we can see your slides. Okay. okay. All right. So good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone who's attending this webinar today. Thank you for taking your, 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 your time out of your busy schedules to attend our first uh, heart failure webinar. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Gary Gunn, and I am a heart failure cardiologist based in Sydney, uh, where I lead the heart failure service in the Western Sydney Local Health District. Now, over the 10, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, I guess, I shall be presenting a clinical scenario that ties in with the theme of our webinar today. Uh, this is a case that I recently became involved in and a case that I think highlights, I guess, the discussion, the, the wonderful discussion that Julian just, just gave us about how heart failure therapy has become, has now has central role in uh, acute decompensated heart failure. And yes, yeah, as, as, um, uh, as, and my title, as Jonathan uh, had just introduced, uh, the title of my study, uh, my presentation today is Perseverance, Not Perspiration. So um, our case today will be on Mrs. VR, a 65-year-old lady from home who presents with chest pains. Uh, she has no previous cardiac history or significant co comorbidities, and her only vas modifiable vascular risk factor was that of hypercholesterolemia. She was not diabetic and did not smoke. Now on presentation to the emergency department, her ECG is shown here. And what we can see is that there is still eleva ele elevation in the anterior lateral leads, suggestive of an anterior transmural myocardial infarct. So she was taken to the lab emergently and the figures here basically show um, the results of her coronary angiogram, which is that of an occluded proximal LED. Her left circumflex had some minor disease and her RCA was normal. Now, given her coronary anatomy, she underwent coronary stenting with a single drug eluding stent, and this was fortunately successful and uncomplicated. She received upstream dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagrelor, and also received intraprocedural heparin. And her transthoracic echocardiogram post infarct showed a mildly impaired left ventricular systolic function with an LVEF of 45% and anterior regional wall motion abnormalities, as we could expect, as well as mild mitral regurgitation. So Mrs. VR was admitted to the coronary care unit um, and within 24 hours of revascularization, unfortunately, we were, were notified by nursing staff that she was unwell, nauseous and vomiting. She was tachycardic with a heart rate of 110 with a low grade temperature and she was desaturating on room air. Concerningly, her repeat ECG now showed a left bundle branch block morphology. 
Now, even though she was Scarborough says negative, she looked unwell enough that we thought a relook coronary angiogram would be a good idea. But before we could arrange for this to happen, Mrs. VR unfortunately deteriorated clinically. She developed some chest discomforts and breathlessness. And before she could be reviewed by the medical team, unfortunately was noted to have ventricular standstill and cardiac monitoring. CPR was commenced and she was intubated. So after 40 minutes of CPR, she, Mrs. VR had successful return of spontaneous circulation. She did go for a relook coronary angiogram, which unfortunately showed an acute stent thrombosis. She, the, 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 the LED was treated successfully with another drug eluding stent, but post revascularization, she continued to deteriorate with persistent hypertension and rising lactate levels. As she was clearly progressing into cardiogenic shock, an intraaortic balloon pump was inserted and she was also started on ECMO. Mrs. Via spent the next week and a half in the intensive care. She received tyrofibin and heparin for the first 48 hours and, then, and was also supported with noradrenaline and dobutamine for the better part of that time. She had some new onset atrial fibrillation that was treated with, with some amiodarin. A repeat transthoracic echocardiogram unfortunately showed moderate to severe impaired, severely impaired left ventricular function with injection fraction that had declined to about 30 to 35%. And concerningly, there was now severe mitral regurgitation. Now, despite that, she progressed fairly well um, with the inotropic support. Her ECMO was decannulated and her balloon pump was removed. She was weaned off noradrenaline and dobutamine and, in fact, was looking quite well and then stepped down to the ward. Now, now that we have the backdrop of Mrs. VR, I guess for us heart failure enthusiasts, this is where it gets really interesting because within 24 to 48 hours of her discharge from intensive care, Mrs. VR started becoming unwell. She was noted to become uh, persistently tachycardic and ECG confirmed sinus. She was borderline hypotens hypotensive with her average systolic blood pressure averaging around 95 to 105. She was fluid overloaded and with ongoing oxygen requirements. And she also had intermittent fevers, which was presumed to be infarct related. And she was commenced on colchicine for this. Now, as she was still on intravenous diuretics at this time, we increased her dose of fruzomide to 80 milligrams PD and from a base dose of 40 milligrams PD. This seemed to work well, and she achieved clinically, she, she became clinically euvolemic within 72 hours. She was converted to oral fruzomide. Chemodynamically, she was doing a bit better. She had an improved blood pressure, but unfortunately was still persistently tachycardic. Now, at this point, we thought, it would be a good idea for us to initiate some heart failure therapy. And with that in mind, we started with low-dose beta blocker, low-dose RNA, as well as an MRA. She just seemed to tolerate this well enough for about two days, and then unfortunately had a code for increasing oxygen requirement and respiratory distress with a repeat chest X-ray demonstrating pulmonary congestion. We performed a repeat transthoracic echocardiogram, and this, as you can see here, showed a mildly dilated left ventricular cavity with moderate to severely impaired function with an ejection fraction of 25%. There was apical akinesis with early aneurysmal formation, and there was severe mitral regurgitation. And this the mitral regurgitation in itself was thought to be the precipitant for her pulmonary edema. Now she was recommenced on intravenous diuretics um, and in fact made an improvement clinically. She was still persistently tachycardic, still, and as, a, and as she started developing some symptomatic hypotension, we had no choice but to withdraw the ARNI. We also reduced her dose of spironolactone, but unfortunately the moment we did that, she had another code for desaturation and the repeat chest X-ray showed once again pulmonary congestion. She was recommenced on intravenous diuretics, and this time around, we thought we'd take a different approach and start her on some evabronine to slow her down, and then subsequently an SGLT2 inhibitor, dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams daily. Now, Mrs. Villar surprisingly progressed quite well with the addition of the SGLT2 and evabrodine. She, um, she, though she remained still tachycardic, her blood pressure and her blood pressure did reduce marginally. She was actually quite looking quite well clinically. Uh, her oxygen requirements decreased. We did a repeat echocardiogram just for the sake of uh, at, at evaluating her left ventricular function and to see if there was any improvement. And I guess surprisingly, unsurprisingly, there wasn't any improvement where her ejection fraction stayed static at 25%. There was a marginal improvement, however, in her degree of mitral regurgitation. As she had no further fevers, her cold was seized. 
and she was cleared by Allied Health and discharged home. Now, I wish I could tell you that this is the end of the case and that Mrs. VR lived happily ever after, but sadly, it is not over. Within a week and a half, she represented to the emergency department with respiratory distress and lower limb edema. Chest X-ray once again showed pulmonary edema, and, and this time around, she had bilateral pleural effusions. Her ECG showed persistent sinus tachycardia. She had evidence of end organ hypoperfusion with renal impairment and mild hepatic dysfunction, both of which were new. And she was also noted to be quite anemic. She was hypotensive and tachycardic. Uh, she was commenced on intravenous diuretics again, received a short course of CPAP and was also commenced on dobutamine infusion. We reached out to in the intensive care at this team at this point in time. And unfortunately, they felt that she was not suitable to return to the intensive care, given how frail that she had become, and recommended palliative care input instead. And I guess to, to give you a better idea, you know, following her initial admission, this is a small lady that would weigh about 55 kilograms when, when she had when we had first come to know her. And during the time, during the short time that you know she had been unwell, she had lost about 10 kilograms in weight and came in about 45 kilograms. Now we readmitted her to the coronary care unit and she progressed reasonably well with improvement in her edema with intravenous diuretics as well as dobutamine. Now, now despite several days of, of therapy, she unfortunately still had significant residual edema. A dose of frusamide was increased, but not for long as once again, you know, she would develop symptomatic hypotension every time we escalated the dose of the loop diuretic. Now, at this point in time, our, my back was against the wall and we were running out of options. Um, I'm not too sure what it is like in other institution, institutions, but for us in Sydney, whenever there is a challenging case with an unwell patient, two things will happen. Everyone from the cardiologist to the intern to the nurse to the ward clerk will know about it, and everyone will suddenly have an opinion to share with you. So on the left, uh, on my left was basically physicians telling me, look, it might be time for you to pull out and give up and just palliate her, keep her comfortable. On the other side of, uh, on, on, on the right, on my right ear, there would be people whispering in my ear saying, look, why don't you do what exactly the voice that's, that's speaking to you in the left ear? <laughs> and so I, I guess a bit desperate, I reached out to uh, several colleagues uh, and mentors just for some advice. And I thought, you know, why don't we go with option C and let her live? And so we we embarked on, I guess you could say, uh, sequential in sequential nephron blockade. Um, and in this regard, we reduced her frusamide and her spironolactone, and we commenced her on acetazolamide and hydrochlorothiazide. It was a risky move because she was already borderline hypotensive with a systolic blood pressure of about 90 to 95 on a good day. But surprisingly, this seemed to work. And within a couple of days, she had improvement in her congestion. There was also improvement in her blood pressure. She was still tachycardic, which we thought, you know, there was nothing that we could do about it at that point in time. We did, however, stop her carvedilol in place for low-dose nabivalol, digoxin, and ramipril. And we thought we were winning. But unfortunately, once again, within 48 hours, she developed respiratory distress and a code, and repeat chest x-ray showed pulmonary congestion. She was recommenced on intravenous diuretics. Uh, her, her average systolic blood pressure seemed to improve with this. Uh, she had a blood pressure of about 100 systolic and her heart rate still ran at about 95 to 100 beats per minute. Now, interestingly, at this point in time, I guess um, um, we started noticing a couple of trends in terms of her decompensation. First of all, you know, each time her heart rate would drop below 85 beats per minute, that was when she started becoming unwell and would go into pulmonary edema. Also, the repeat blood test did show some hypo, and, and as a result of that, we withdrew her nabivalol. As her repeat blood test started showing some hyponatremia as well, we stopped her hydrochlorothiazide. We kept, we kept her under similar therapy for the next week and a half. And during this time, she managed to maintain euvolemia. Her repeat transthoracic echocardiogram showed severely impaired left ventricular function with an ejection fraction of 25 to 30%. And as previously, there was moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. At this point in time, we also started her on very sequa 2.5 milligrams daily. She was cleared by Allied Health and was discharged home. Now, what happened to Mrs. VR? Uh, so over the next month, we reviewed her weekly in our heart failure clinics. 
And amazingly, she continued to remain stable. Her hemodynamics, in fact, improved with this current cocktail of medications. We uptitrated her very secret to 10 milligrams daily and also uptitrated her ramipril slowly. This was her repeat transthoracic echocardiogram. As you can see, there has been some interval improvement in her left ventricular function. Over the next three months, she continued to improve. Um, she managed to maintain euvolemia and didn't have any other uh, any further decompensations or readmissions to hospital. Her frizomide was actually reduced to 20 milligrams and then subsequently withdrawn. Her repeat transthoracic echocardiogram, as we just showed, showed an ejection fraction of 30%. And in fact, there was improvement in her mitral regurgitation, which I, I hadn't mentioned before. Um, Around four weeks uh, into, I guess, her progress, we, we thought that she her hemodynamics was stable enough that we withdrew her ramipro and her, she retrialed her on secubitral with valsartan. Her evabridine was also up titrated to five milligrams PD. Mrs. Via did well. And in the months that came after that, she had no further decompensations. She had a continued improvement in functional state and was pretty much mobilizing up to two kilometers on a regular day. She was NYHA functional class one. Her transthoracic echocardiogram continued to show improvement in her left ventricular function, marginal, but still a win. She was initially planned for a CRTD insertion, but after a discussion with herself, she decided to defer it for now as she was enjoying life too much. She was recommenced on low dose beta blocker therapy and this time around tolerated it without any issues. So my take home messages with this case is, I think we are in the era of heart failure therapy. And with the increased armamentarium of medications that we have nowadays, we have an increased flexibility to achieve personalized therapy and by understanding clinical phenotypes and disease pathophysiology. I think as, as Julian had succinctly put, the optimization of heart failure therapy is key to better outcomes. And to do this, we need to have a good, strong knowledge of pharmacotherapy and understanding of hemodynamics and above all, don't ever forget, don't perspire, just persevere. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Gary. Perhaps I can have you stop share the screen before you jump into the yeah. discussion. For the interest of time, we only probably have five minutes for this fantastic case presented by Gary. Um, very unfortunate lady who had a sequelae after anterior MI complicated by a stent thrombosis, bad uh, AMI cardiogenic shock, and then early readmission and long stay. So perhaps just two focus on the, uh, for the panelists to consider the question around is how do you deal with the subset when you're trying to titrate the fantastic four around the scenario of low blood pressure and tachycardia? And the second bit is how do you gauge fertility in this heart failure patients? Yeah. Uh, what are yeah. the parameters for that? Yeah. Uh, perhaps I can start with um, a question back to Gary first, asked by the audience, is that I saw that you used uh, Corolan early in a patient that was managed with amiodarone for atrial fibrillation. Well, was that uh, paroxysmal or why was, well, would that be a contraindication to use Corolan in this case? Yeah, so I think we use, the amiodarone was used as a as a I guess a method of control of atrial fibrillation, which bear in mind was a very short lived episode. She only had I think in total about forty five minutes worth of atrial fibrillation, and following amiodarone commencement, she never had recurrence of the arrhythmia. Um, the use of evabridine in this situation was more out of desperation. I guess she her blood pressure was. I guess you could say was teetering very, very low on a regular day. And in fact, you know, I guess what 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 I didn't show in this presentation was that on, on a regular day, she would have at least six reviews by the by the cardiology team just for concerns of hypo uh, of hypotension. And each time we dosed the beta blocker, you could see that you know her heart rate did reduce, but her blood pressure also reduced as well. If Aberdeen was in this situation, just a measure to try to slow her down, because I think going back to first principles, I guess my thought process was dry her out, dry her out as much as you can, slow her down, give her some increased cardiac output, and you'll be much more comfortable dosing the four pillars. And in this situation, as you can see, we ran around in circles a little bit because, you know, our, our, our normal mandate is to start with a beta blocker. And I guess in this situation, it turned out to be the little poison that, that she couldn't tolerate. Um, but regardless, I guess, you know, the, in terms of ass assessing futility, Jack, I think this was one of the biggest things for me, because I think around the 10th or 15th, I guess you could say review, you know, I think people start questioning, 
why don't we pull out? Is this a futile situation? ICU first certainly felt that way. But I guess what sort of clued me into to push on was the fact that she does respond. You know, she every time we up titrate therapy, she does respond. And in fact, it was just in the in our efforts to stabilize and to optimize that she started becoming unwell. Uh, and I guess, you know, knowing that without stabilization or optimization, she would do even worse in the community. That was to me very important. After we stabilize, after we sort of hemodynamically stabilize her, it was so important for us to optimize her. Because if not, I think every, all the coming weeks in the heart failure clinics would essentially be spent in the same way, running in a circle, trying to stabilize her. <laughs> Very scary. Uh, maybe I get uh, one comment from Wei Ching. You, you have this scenario where a patient was very sick, was on IBP and ECMO. How do you actually wean and titrate the medication around um, uh, MCS mechanical support in the AMI cardiogenic shock scenario to, to take off the devices appropriately in this case? So it's really not easy because if you look at all the fantastic four clinical trials, they are in ambulatory patients and they excluded all patients with uh, systolic blood pressure less than 100. So in a hypotensive patient just recovered from shock, just explanted uh, from an ECMO circuit, probably never been studied in big clinical trials. So that's the problem. And we are really trying our best to make sense of how to deal with the patient given the current hemodynamics that we are faced with. Um, one, one trick that I've learned without, again, much uh, strong clinical trial support to, is to go for invasive hemodynamic assessment, put in a PA catheter at the point of explantation of mechanical support to know what you are exactly dealing with. For example, you can explant the ECMO, you, ex, uh, you remove the IVP, and then you find that the patient has very borderline cardiac output and very high uh, vascular resistance. Maybe a solution would be to vasodilate a little bit so that you can reduce the chance of her going into acute pulmonary edema, something like that. That will probably buy you some time to uh, slowly step up on the guideline-directed medical therapy. So that's a trick that I've learned. Maybe the patient also has a need for a short duration of inotrope support. That can, you can also find that out on invas invasive hemodynamic assessment. Again, that buys you time, may not make a big difference in the long run, but it can help you slowly up hydrate your guideline directed medical therapy. Thanks, Weijing. Any pressing comments or questions from the panel before I jump to the next oh, question? Look, I'd, first of all, congratulations, Gary, on that outcome, because having a patient that's had an arrest immediately in hospital with 40 minutes CPR before you get return of spontaneous circulation, that's... Phenomenal. You must be quick on the cannulas with your ECMO because, you know, you look at the inception <laughs> trial and that would patient, I think the inception trial was telling us probably is, is almost futile, but no, well done. Probably some things I might have done differently, but it's so easy in mm. retrospect. I don't think it would have made any differences. I probably tend not to get go with the beta blockers that early in, a, in, a, in the patient. Mm. I think you did make the comment, Gary, they were uvolemic, so fair enough. I might have gone with a bit of Ramipril or Perindopril, NACE inhibitor, not the Arnie, a bit of Sp um, Spiro, and maybe even nowadays a bit of SGLT2 inhibitor, and then put the beta blocker in a bit later. I probably would have used Dijoxin as well. And I saw there were comments about using Dijoxin and Abradine. In fact, about 20% of the patients in Shift HF were on Dijoxin or a cardiac glycoside. I don't know about amiodarone because I can see that question was about that as well, but I can't see any good reason not to combine them all. The amio might keep them out of AF so that Vabradine works better. So I'd have no trouble, you know, I'd probably get the Dig on board. I, I was comfortable with the uh, Vabradine and then get the beta blocker in later. I was interested that you use Colchicine for fever there. I must admit that's not something that I'm doing, so I must be missing something there. So that's, that was an interesting one. But um, but no, just that was a brilliant outcome for what was, a, you know, had, that patient had every adverse prognostic marker. So well done. Thanks. Uh, fantastic comment, John. I agree with all the points. I I would say that uh, those low-dose, short-acting ACE inhibitors would be my first choice so that you can U-turn if you're hitting it too hard and too early. Um, the tacticardia is just a marker that the patient is very vulnerable. So the beta blockade usually plunges them back down and you have very limited options. Uh, I just quickly addressed the question of mitral clip here. 
I think you have to really assess whether the acute MR is dynamic enough. I presume it probably was. When the heart rate goes up and the flash power meter comes in, there could be that LV uh, dysfunction and the functional dynamic acute MR. But I'm not too sure whether there's sufficient data at the moment to say that the mitral clip in this acute setting is definitely going to help. If possible, I would have done it your way. I have done only one case where it was a left main thrombosis that had to implant a acute mitral clip to just get the patient out of the hospital. But most of the time, uh, I, I would advise against uh, that. Uh, John, back to you. Let's go to the next uh, case. Okay, so now we're going to head off to our last case uh, by Dr. Vibiona, who's going to take us through a case uh, all the way from um, admission all the way to pre-discharge. Uh. Baby, please. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Uh, can you see my slide? No? Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you. It was a very interesting and a very phenomenal case from Gary. So uh, I would like to present the next case discussion. Good evening for everyone. Uh, this will be a very simple case of heart failure done to earth about the stage man of management in acute heart failure from immediate to pre-discharge phase. So when the patient diagnosed with heart failure, it's actually it's only the starting point of healthcare journey of heart failure patients. Long-term management is very, very uh, crucial. Heart failure patients are at ongoing risk of acute decompensation, hospitalization, and of course, uh, death to the, uh, due to the cardiovascular. In reality, the heart failure care is often fragmented and suboptimal. Many patients do not receive recommended uh, GDMT and many patients very, has very poor follow-up monitoring and support. Rehospitalization risk is particularly high soon after uh, hospitalization. We say that uh, three months after hospitalization is a vulnerable uh, stage. As we can see in here, uh, the number of uh, deaths and the number of hospitalization in a patient after uh, three months of heart failure, it's uh, significantly in, improved, especially in patients who did not receive a very optimal medical therapy. In the real-world setting, optimization of uh, GDMT, actually, we all know that will improve outcomes. But unfortunately, some data of uh, some studies say that some physician it's our, our decision not to optimize, not to initiate of GDMT, increase the cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in the patient. So I always say that hospitalization is a blast in disguise in a patient with acute decompensated of heart failure because hospitalization actually is the key moment to optimize the treatment. Successful hospital strategies associated with a 30 days at readmission rate reduction, as we can see in here. So most of the uh, provider is a cardiologist. And when we start the GDMT uh, earlier, so the patient will have a very low number of uh, rehospitalization and cardiovascular death. Let's start with the cases. This is a story of a really a relatively young lady. She's obese. His BMI was more than uh, 36, admitted in the emergency room uh, because of worsening of breath in the last past uh, two weeks. Previously, she had a uh, deep non effort, orthopnoe, PND, and gradual leg swellings without any sign of chest pain. And uh, she is, has obesity, untreated hypertension, and newly diagnosed of diabetes type 2. Blood pressure in emergency room was high, and the heart rate was uh, really, really elevated. And uh, she stuck it new. And the saturate, uh, the room air saturation was uh, 98% with a decreased vascular breath in left lung. Rails in the base of the right lungs, and we can see the uh, moderate edema of his leg, of her leg. This is a chest X-ray. We can see in here it's a massive pleural effusion of the left 
a lung, and it is ECG is a LBBB pattern with a very tachycardic uh, sign. From the laboratory, we can uh, see the uh, random blood glucose was high with a high uh, A1C also, but the uh, kidney function still good. Based on the clinical phenotype presentation of acute heart failure, the patient is uh, in a group of acutely compensated heart failure. This is a stage of management of patient with acute heart failure. It has immediate phase, intermediate phase, and predisturbs and long-term phase. It's very nice in the guidelines of uh, ESG in 2021. It mentioned uh, goals and procedures for the patient in acute decompensated acute heart failure patient. So we can use this as a guide for our patient when hospitalized with heart, acute heart failure. This management of acute decompensated heart failure already mentioned by Julian before, as long as the patient has no organ hypoperfusion or organ damage, has no diuretic resistance, has no end-stage renal failure, so we should start medical therapy optimization as early as soon as possible. The therapy given to the patient in immediate phase was we bolus the furosemide uh, 1 mg per kilograms continuous with infusion furosemide 10 mg per hour and the urine output was very good, very responsive to 2,400 cc in 6 hours but the shortness of breath was not relief at the time. The blood pressure was stable. Uh, uh, and then, but the heart rate still elevated and she's still tachypnic. The blood gl 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 uh, glucose regulation is already uh, with insulin and we did a uh, bedside portable V-scan and with focus, we can see the uh, ejection fraction was 30%, around 30% with massive less chloral effusion. Uh, the work of breathing of the patient still high. She was still complaining of heavy shortness of breath. And we think for what should we do next? Shall we increase for the diuretic therapy or shall we do something? But in my experience in, in this kind of patient, the third space compartment, it's a uh, really a very, very slow response with a diuretic. So we decided to do a left oracle synthesis and 1,500 cc serous hemorrhage fluid withdrawn from left pleura. And we tested for uh, her for TB because the ESR is very high and Indonesia is very endemic for TB. And after that, this is the uh, chest X-ray right after the left oracle synthesis and the symptoms of heart failure was relieved after that. In the intermediate phase of acute heart failure, this is the second uh, phase of acute uh, stage management of acute heart failure, we should determine the etiology, improve sign and symptoms, limit organ damage, and prevent thromboembolism. The patient tested negative for troponin, no sign of symptom and symptoms of uh, acute coronary syndrome. syndrome. So we thought that uh, the precipitating factors of uh, the heart failure, acute decompensated of heart failure in this patient was high blood pressure and high blood glucose and a newly diagnosed with diabetes. So in this phase, we should identify the etiology. We already did it and uh, treat the relevant comorbidities and start targeted treatment. And titrate therapy to control symptoms and to relieve congestion, manage hypoperfusion and optimize blood pressure. Initiate up to treat the therapy for uh, uh, the heart failure. To initiate the disease-modifying pharmacotherapy, the therapy given within 24 hours was uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, antiplatelet, ACE inhibitor, spironolactones, and the statins, and blood glucose with insulin, foods, and salt restriction. The furosemide dose was decreased due to after, after uh, thoracosynthesis because the urine output was really good. We haven't uh, started the beta blockers because uh, the beta blockers should be initiated in clinically stable patient, euvolemic, and the patient has not. And the patient, uh, in the patient, and then we should start uh, with a lower dose later. 
So the aims of treatment optimization in acute decompensated heart failure patient before discharge, as I uh, mentioned before, that we should relieve congestion to relieve the symptoms, improve the symptoms and improve the quality of life of the patient. The second one is to treat comorbidities. And uh, this is also to prevent the readmission and the optimize of oral medical therapy with the beneficial effect of, of comes to improve survival, prevent the cardiovascular death, prevent the readmission. So we should initiate and update rate disease modifying pharmacological and device therapy and develop a care plan with the, with the identification of caregivers. And don't forget, and we should initiate the rehabilitation as early as possible. We did rehabilitation, phase one rehabilitation, when the patient uh, even still in the CVCU, when the patient in, uh, was clinically stable and we tend to move the patient in the sitting position and then that's just uh, to learn to move the muscle and then to sit down and then to stand up sometimes. And sometimes when the, uh, she's real stable, we start to move the patient uh, by walking in uh, several steps. In the ASC guidelines 2021, pre-discharge assessment and post-discharge management planning sh show that uh, optimization of medical treatment is associated, is associated with a uh, lower risk of 30 days readmission. A retrospective analysis so that this continuation of dose reduction of several drugs, especially a beta blocker therapy during acute heart failure, is associated with worse outcome. And don't forget that we should maintain euphoromic states of the patient. Because persistent congestion before discharge is associated with higher risk of readmission and mortality. Treatment, including diuretic dose, should be therefore optimized in order to keep the patient free of congestion. This is the echocardiography of the patient before discharge. As uh, if you can see in here, the patient or is, uh, was only admitted for three days. See this chart at day four with this kind of echocardiography. We can see she, she is very obese, so it's really hard to get a very good echo window in this patient. But we can see that uh, the chambers all dilated, the ejection fraction reduced. It's about 34% with mild TR, but the right function is still good. This is the condition before the patient of the patient before discharge. No shortness of breath. The blood pressure is really good, but the heart rate is still a little bit elevated. No rails, no edema, and this is the drugs before discharge. Uh, Antiplatelet ACE inhibitor optimized, spironolactone optimized, bisoprolol 2.5 milligrams. It's uh, it was a little bit risky to give her a uh, intermediate dose. It's, it's still low, but the low dose we initiated with 1.25 because the heart rate still high above 100. So we decided to give her a 2.5 with a very careful and then uh, we, we really, really carefully uh, maintain the, the volume status also and then uh, then and uh, to see the congestion whether it's back or not and we start uh, empagliflozin in this patient based on the ampal study as uh, julian mentioned before the patient hospitalized for acute heart failure treated with empagliflozin has 36 uh, percent more clinical benefit versus patient on placebo this ofica study say, stated that elevated heart rate at hospital discharge predicts one year mortality. We can see in here, compare with uh, less than 64 uh, BPM, then more than 80 BPM, the mortality risk is uh, higher about a 40, 41%. So we have a problem in here. We consider what sh shall we do? What should we do? Because, because the patient still has 
96 BPM heart rate before discharge. So maybe we can consider the increase of the dose of beta blocker before discharge with a lot of risk. They compensate, could decompensate it after discharge or hemodynamic unstable after discharge. We don't know. We cannot monitor the patient after discharge. Or as conventional therapy back then, we can add some digoxin or we can add alpha-bredin or just let it be. I don't know, but this is option for, for the clinician. But we decided to give her alpha-bredin twice daily as we can see in this trial that alpha-bredin in combination with beta blocker in stabilized patient during hospitalization will improve LV systolic function after one year. This is the current after uh, the current condition of the patient, after five, four months of uh, acute decompensated heart failure, uh, as you can see in here, the ejection fraction was improved and she was in NIHA functional class one or rehospitalization with optimized medical therapy. The beta blockers therapy uh, already on top and uh, we uh, hold the IFA Braden dose in twice daily, five milligrams. As a conclusion, heart failure management is a long life journey. There is a rift phase of increased risk and always take the opportunities to optimize and enhance the GDMT. Early optimization of therapy will ensure the best outcomes in heart failure patient. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Vebi. I think this was a good case uh, highlighting, you know, the different stages uh, of a patient with acute heart failure, you know, all the way from admission to the acute phase and to titrating therapy in the slightly more chronic phase. Uh. I've, I've got a question that I'm quite keen to ask. Uh, you know, you had a slide that says um, that the guidelines recommend not um, titrating down or discontinuing beta blockers um, yeah. in some of these settings. And we do know, like from experience and even... Um, Gary's first case that some of these patients really cannot take beta blockers. I wonder, you know, what's the panel's view about um, the role of beta blockers, especially in acute um, heart failure deterioration? Um, does it is it a surrogate of the EF? You know, the lower the EF, you may want to stay away more. And if it's higher EF, you know, you can kind of tolerate some of these. Um, anyone has any comments or, or thoughts? Maybe, Maybe. You can ask Julian. Yeah. Uh, Julian? Um, sure, thanks. Yeah, so I think it's quite difficult. It's a bit of, this is a clinical call. Uh, we do know that withdrawal of beta blocker therapy during the inpatient uh, episode is associated with worse outcome. But when they go into advanced heart failure, the negative inotropic of effect of the beta blocker is a problem. So then the question is, how do you define advanced heart failure? If you look at the ESC 2021 guidelines, they have four criteria, one of which is EF cut off of, I think it's about 30-35%. The ACC did not choose to use an EF cutoff. From an advanced heart failure perspective, I generally close my eyes to EF. I don't really regard EF too much. I get guided by clinical parameters, by hemodynamic parameters, and by uh, functional capacity, specifically the peak VO2. But I do appreciate other people might view the EF as something that is um, prognostic, which it is. I think as a heart failure community, we are moving away from the use of an EF. Uh, to guide us, apart from the guideline-directed medical therapy, the cutoff of about 40%. But we are generally, as a community, moving away from EF cutoffs. So I think it's really identifying the advanced heart failure phenotype. And I guess, put it this way, if the person is on inotropic support, beta blockers should definitely be withdrawn. Uh, and then there's a bit of a spectrum in between, which is a bit of a clinical call as to when you think the beta blocker uh, is causing a bit of problems. Thank you. I would look at it a bit more simply to say that if Regardless of EF, the patient is tachycardic and in shock, and you have maybe even a raised lactate or requirement of anotropes, then beta blocker shouldn't be used in that circumstance. Uh, reaching? Yeah, maybe it's just a simple, um, you know, some simple parameters can guide us. For example, if the patient is hypotensive or borderline blood pressure, maybe beta blockers shouldn't be the first medication that we're thinking of. If the patient came in with uh, acute pulmonary edema, uh, precipitated by a hypertensive episode, then this kind of patients, usually they are the warm and wet kind, are more comfortable to use beta blocker even very early on in their disease trajectory. So that's uh, my general guide. Feel the patient's extremities. If they are tending towards cold and clammy, 
probably stay away from beta blocker, at least in the acute phase. Okay, uh, that, that's very useful uh, guidance you know, for us uh, on the ground. Also, would like to ask, um, you know, everybody's talking about the MPALS trial and um, empagliflozin. Do we think that um, this is a kind of a class effect, you know, regardless of whichever SGLT2 uh, that we use? Maybe I can ask uh, Professor Atherton, you know, what, what he thinks. Yeah, I think I'm always a bit cautious about using the word class effect. We use it for ACE inhibitors. I guess we sort of use it for ARBs. But we once upon a time we were going to use it for beta blockers when we had these, you know, carvedilol, bisoprolol, uh, long acting metoprolol all look brilliant. You just say, oh, surely that's a class effect. Three beta blockers tick the box. Then along comes Comet and then along comes Best. And then suddenly we say, oh, it's not a class effect. So at the moment, we come to SGLT2 inhibitors. Well, we, we certainly have two, you know, dapicaflozin and empicaflozin. Sodicaflozin is not available to us. And, of course, it's not just an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor. So um, at the moment, I'm a bit cautious to say class effect. And, uh, and so I would use the drugs that have been shown to work. So I wouldn't use that term now um, but yet, yet. Maybe down the track if we get it for other SGLT2 inhibitors. But right now, I'd be saying it's either dapicaflozin or empicaflozin. And it's pretty simple, they're the same dose. So that's my thoughts. So maybe you can ask uh, Kay actually, um, for this type of cases, are you comfortable with a non-invasive evaluation of the coronaries or do you actually have to adjudicate and clear that upfront for some of these cases you think? Uh, I just, just a segue, I thought the ECG was very nice initially, showing the classic Goldberger's uh, triad, you know, the small, frontal limb leads and the large uh, uh, four hour progression in the frontal leads. Uh, Kay, maybe your, your usual. Yeah. Purpose. So usually for like, I have a patient now coming in for an ejection fraction of 18%. So should, for this patient, um, if the patient has a very high risk for coronary artery disease, like the patient is a smoker, the patient, this case is a patient is diabetic. So I would, I would advise for an invasive evaluation for the coronaries because if we if we're missing out on the coronaries with a very poor ejection fraction, then that would would influence the outcome of this patient. So, but if for example a patient comes in with no risk factor, just a cardiomyopathic type of patients, then I would just evaluate it non-invasively. But for patients with high risk factors for coronary artery disease, then I would go for an invasive and then. Um, do management, do manage it. So just an angiogram and um, advise the patient that if there is a significant obstruction, then we will push through revascularization for these patients. Okay, I think uh, we are running right on the dot uh, here. Um, I think everybody will have agreed that this is, has been a very good and interactive uh, session. I'd like to summarize uh, some key learning points uh, for our audiences today. Today, I think uh, we went through the whole uh, undermentarium on how to manage uh, acute heart failure. Very importantly, uh, from the lecture, we understand that there are four different subtypes. And if you can kind of group them uh, into the subtype uh, that they are presenting with, you know, it will help guide your management. In the acute setting, we know congestion predominates and it's really important to try to dry them out um, using potentially a combination of diuretics. And uh, once they are out of the acute phase while they are inpatient, you know, we can try to explore starting some of the... Uh, Go directed uh, medical therapy. Of course, you know, as we can see from the two different cases, you know, each case is very different. And we kind of have to uh, titrate our therapies um, according to the patient. Some can tolerate higher doses, some can't. And uh, when in doubt, uh, when, when you need help, you know, um, it's good to really ask uh, friends, colleagues, um, seniors, you know, for some help in terms of how they would manage. And these kind of advice sometimes are very beneficial. Um, I would just like to say that uh, this is the first of our series of uh, webinars. You know, there will be some more coming up, so do look out for them. And another shout out uh, for our APSC 2023 Congress that's happening in July. There are a lot of exciting and educational sessions. We also do have uh, dedicated sessions for trainees and um, uh, younger folks, board review courses, data interpretation sessions. So do check out the APSC uh, 2023 website. Uh. So thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, all our speakers, my co-chair, Dr. Jack, as well as uh, all the panelists. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Do join us for APSC 2023 in Singapore. <laughs>
see everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.